our next presenter is our last presenter, uh, Barbara Lundberg. Hi. I wonder if we can hear you. You are muted. Hi. Oh, good. No. Great. Sure did. Awesome. So just, just, just in time. <laughs> just in time. Um, so good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I guess, uh, with yeah. you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> All right. So um, your paper is visiting the visual performance practice in the virtual artworks of Bob Hamilton and Christoph Rossi. So uh, anytime that you're ready, we are ready for you. So, so my topic. Let me see. Yeah. Is uh, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm confused because it's now a little bit earlier than I thought, and um, I just have to get my get my mind around the uh, presented now. So, first of all, thank you for for the invitation to talk at your conference. I'm very sorry that I miss it all. It's just um, for us, it's in, almost still in the middle of the night. So I'm I envy you a little bit that you had all these uh, concerts and the talks. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Barbara Lüneburg. I'm Professor of Artistic Research at Anton Bruckner Private University in Austria, and I was a key researcher for performance practice in GAP, the artistic research project I'm talking about today. GAP has been a four years research project that was based at the University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz, Austria, and was financed by the Austrian Science Fund. So as you, have heard, as you have heard, my topic today is visiting the virtual performance practice in the visual artworks of Rob Hamilton and Christoph Ressi. Um, and I would like you, I will concentrate today on one work by Christoph Ressi because otherwise the talk would be too long, but uh, in the proceedings you can read the whole text, the whole paper, and there you will have a comparison then between the two pieces by Rob Hamilton and Christoph Ressi. So here, a brief um, overview on the content of today's talk. I will first talk a little bit about what is GAP about. Then I will give you some theoretical basis for my analysis. And um, then I will go deeper into one of the case studies. So let's start with a question of what is GAP about. GAP stands for Gamified Audiovisual Performance and Performance Practice. In GAP, we commission, create, and perform audiovisual compositions that incorporate game aesthetic, game elements, or and game principles. It is important to realize that these pieces are not games per se. The works are concert pieces or um, installations which are performed in a concert setting and they clearly belong to the world of contemporary art, music, or media art. So in GAP, we were interested in the question if and in which way play interactions and game elements that were taken from the world of computer games offer innovative aesthetic potential and new models of player and audience involvement to the artworks and the performance practice. Now, how did we approach these questions as a, as a research project? We developed a tripartite model for our methodology around the fields, um, around those fields, game-based audiovisual work, performance, performance studies, and audience perception. So everything which had to do with conceptualizing and composing of game-based audiovisual works is the field of the composer and artistic researcher Marco Ciciliani, who uh, delivered a talk yesterday. And he was also head of the project. Uh, audience perception was the field of musicologist Andreas Kirchner, and I myself investigated the field of performance and performance studies. Two times a year, we conducted workshops and the so-called lab concerts where we discussed and performed the commission pieces. And these um, periods, working periods, we gather data via participant observation, audience questionnaires, interviews with composers, performers, and audience focus groups. And as it is a principle of artistic research, via the artistic practice itself that is composing and, in my case, performing the works. It is important 
to realize that the gap we moved in three different contexts. We had, first of all, the context of computer games. Then we have the context of contemporary multimedia art. And the context of classical, or not so classical, performance practice. And each of these worlds has their own creative and observant agents, principles, goals, connotations, aesthetic, and even peer groups. So this affected not only the works that were created, but it also had an impact on the audience and what they expected and what they perceived or how they perceived the pieces. And of course, it touched the work of the performer on several levels. So what interests me today in this talk is the following. How do elements of computer games that are incorporated into audiovisual artworks in live concert situations, how do they achieve an aesthetic effect and performative impact on both the work of the performer and the audience's perception? Furthermore, I will explore how the use of virtual reality influences this situation. In my paper, I did this by looking in detail at two different case studies. The first one was moving to Tramachin de la Grasse et Monde um, by a virtual string quartet by Rob Hamilton, who composed uh, this work for one of our gap periods. And um, this is what I will introduce you to today. Terrain study and audiovisual composition for solo instrumentalist and virtual reality system by Christoph Bessel. Both works are located within a virtual reality which unfolds behind the VR glasses of the performers, which you can see here in the little picture, and, uh, but on, at the same time also in the physical reality which is shared with the audience. And this physical reality bears traces of the virtual. Therefore, in my investigation, I will address the representation, representation of space in, in which these works unfold, namely the physical space, the concert performance, and the virtual space in which large parts of the performance take place. So, <clears throat> today I will introduce you, as I said before, to Tanah Study by Christoph Messi. Um, let me see. Um, I will touch on questions such as how does the space of possibility afforded to the performer through the game system, the software design and interfaces influence the player's performative involvement or ludic involvement and range of expression. Um, how do the different spaces influence the performer's task and also the audience perception? Uh, does the audience experience associations with games and how is this established in audience and performance? For, to, to answer these questions, I have to look at uh, the space of possibility, which is the space of all possible actions and meanings that can emerge in the course of the game. And this concept ties together meaning software design, game system, and interactivity. This space of possibility, which is incorporated in, in the multimedia works of GAP, um, they, give the, they offer the player creative agencies. Um, they offer meaningfulness. Um, they um, broaden the range of expression. And that means that Possibly the player can be involved on a level which is uh, on a very high level and in the best case that again will be transferred to the audience in their live concert situation. So the space of possibility is one, um, one aspect which I will explore today and I will use a specific analytical tool which is called the polar diagram or it's, it's a polar diagram which is developed by Marco Siciliani and um, it is meant to as a tool to describe gamified or ludified audiovisual compositions 
and um, the criteria that determine the space of possibilities. So you see here this polar diagram, which has an upper half, which is concerned with all the aspects of the composition, and which has a lower part, which is concerned with all the aspects of the performance. And then you see these different axes, which cross through both uh, halves, through performance and composition, and we have different axes. For example, the interface axis. Um, the interface axis here, uh, you can see the composition half. You can see, okay, which kind of interface do we use? What kind of expertise is required to use this interface? And if you follow this interface axis um, through to the performer half, then you see responsiveness, and the responsiveness tells you how easy is it uh, or how clearly can you use this interface as a performer? How responsive is this? If, if, if you work with this interface, do you immediately feel a response so that you have to feel you can really uh, act with this interface? Or determinism access. This, is, this means in the composition, it means how much is determined through the, the composition. For example, if, if, uh, if the composer has very clear rules, very clear strategies, so that uh, the performer can't really, um, it doesn't have so much um, leeway to, to, to create uh, surprising situations. Or, and then on the performer axis, you can see, okay, um, either you can be very, very spontaneous or you have to do a lot of planning. Um, you can, what, what else do we have? Presence access, for example, liveness and, and input data mapping. And the presence access, if we again look at the composition first, um, this is about the data mapping. If I'm playing on the violin, for example, I'm a violinist, so if I'm playing on the violin and my pitches or my volume or something like that is mapped through the computer system, um, the degree to which it, it is map is measured in the presence axis. And here um, in the performance side, it's, it's about the lightness that I feel when my data is mapped. Do I have to feel feeling that, um, that, do I really realize immediately, okay, I can shape through my input, I can shape the piece. So these are different axes which are, um, <clears throat> which are in this um, tool, analytical tool. And then in the end, we can uh, we put little dots here on um, are there, for example, lots of rules or just few rules in the piece uh, on the Lotus axis. And, and then it will look like this. I'm just, we can connect the dots. It looks like this. And then we see a shape. So if we compare this then with another uh, composition on which we also have an, uh, analyzed, then we will see there a different shape, and then we, it, it makes it very, very clearly, um, very clear where or how uh, work is conceptualized. So this is, let's go back. Next step, um, Christoph Ressi, this is my case study. Um, Christoph, we will soon have a look at it. I'm just, I'm just telling you a little bit about it. Christoph Ressi's Terrain Study is an audiovisual composition for solo instrumentalist and virtual reality system. And it is conceptualized as a gamified or ludified 3D performance environment, um, which takes place both in the virtual and the physical space. Here in the image, you see a little bit of, of the landscape in which the, the, that's the virtual landscape in which the, uh, performer is acting, you see these white orbs which you can interact with as a composer and the landscape is changing through the way you're playing. And it's, first, it's a first person game, you see that the audience and also the performer sees the world always through the perspective of the VR glasses of the, um, of the performer. The performer sees it only through his or her VR glasses, and the, the audience sees the perspective um, on a performance screen. So they can follow the world of the, of the performer, let's say. 
Um, the performer has to create the entire world. There is no reproduced, reproduced or synthesized sound. So through his or her um, improvisation, which will then be uh, uh, which will be fed in a computer system, the whole sound world is created. And the performer also manipulates the, the initial landscape. The initial landscape is quite flat, and through the interaction there will be a volcano coming up and the, the, the landscape is really changing a lot. Um, so, let's have a look. So, this is what you can see. You can see this is what the landscape looks at the beginning, it's like a square, and then we have the sky, and it's quite flat, so not much is happening yet. So here the landscape has changed.
it, I think in the end we can see it again how he interacts with the orcs quite in the end, even further, almost at, at the very end. Yeah. Okay. It's, sorry. Yeah. Perfect. As a player, you can approach them, and when you are at a certain distance, they turn red. And in that moment, they record whatever you're doing. And then it's in a buffer, and they keep um, they keep pulsing, and they will repeat in a loop what you were doing. So you can feed them with sound, and when you uh, connect again with them, you can feed them with silence, or you can feed them with another sound, and it's actually quite fun. So all. The music you saw. So, uh, okay, let's let's start with the uh, analysis in the interface axis. Um, in the composition, you see that the whole landscape is an interface for the player. They um, they can really shape this landscape, and the way they shape it, they will shape the visual experience for the for the audience. They will shape the sound uh, experience for the audience. And um, so there is a lot of responsiveness on the interface axis, which is why both dots on the interface axis are really in the extreme. Um, the determinism axis shows in the composition side, it's more in the middle, because there is, of course, there's a frame, there's the kind, how this landscape uh, in, in the computer system, how it reacts. And, uh, but there are no rules in the sense that you really have to follow, but you, there, there are uh, suggestions what you can do. And um, in the determinism access also for the performance, also somewhere in the middle, because on the one hand, you can be really, really spontaneous, but on the other hand, you also have to plan. And overall, um, experience for the audience. So um, it's somewhere in the middle between react as a one at the very moment and keep in mind what you want to do and then try to help these. Uh, the present axis, if we look at that, um, it's again at the very extremes because the input data mapping in the composition is very strong. Every sound uh, is mapped on the computer and uh, will shape the, the overall piece visually and musically. And the, the presence access in the, in the performance, it's also for the liveness, it's really clear for the performer when he or she performs that, that the moment they are doing something, something is happening on this, uh, in the stage. Um, okay, we, the agency access is in the composition is in the, uh, let's look first on, at the performance. The creative leeway we have as a performer is huge. Really, we can make it a really calm piece, we can make it an explosive piece, we can really do whatever we want with it. We can, every kind of input we, we use will somehow influence how this piece works. But then on the other hand, um, performer versus system agency in the composition, it's not, um, it's not completely, you could imagine that it's really more in the middle because that if there's so much leeway for the, for the performance, then what is determined in the composition, but in the composition, um, although there are no specific rules, it can happen that the composer interferes and says, okay, now I'm, um, I'm uh, giving you a surprise, I'm giving you new, new kinds of orbs which react differently, or uh, I change the input data mapping so uh, that something happens, or I catapult you into a different kind of world or something like that. So, um, and the ludus axis, if we look at that, the dominance of rules is very minimal, and uh, so we have a lot of pa paedia, which means just 
play without rules, but more like a, like a, um, yeah, explorative play. So you can see how this tool helps to uh, to look at the different features of the work and to make it more clear how it is put together. Um, the performance involvement. We find that the performance involvement is very much structured by uh, by the meaningfulness. If you have the feeling as a as a performer, it is meaningful what you do. What you do, then your involvement will be really strong. So. At Christoph Ressi, we find meaningfulness with regard to improvisational skills, so we can really enhance our improvisational skills and uh, thus heighten our sense of agency. Um, meaningfulness with regard to creative strategies and goals. We have so many uh, agencies, musically, visually, and strate strategically, that we have the feeling we can really influence the work. We have meaningfulness with regard to musical and visual objectives. Um, our creative and creative decisions make strategic, um, make traceable sense, and they really it's really satisfying because we have the feeling that we are shaping this world. Um, and even sometimes, um, ha even the unexpected challenges uh, are, are interesting to to deal with. And then we have meaningfulness with regard to the interaction with the audience because the audience understands what is going on. They can really follow what we are doing. And so they are drawn into our world. So how is the piece in, um, received by the audience? Um, more than 90%, sorry, this is early, more than 90% of the respondents said that, uh, of, of our questionnaire, they said that the game aspect of the performance was central for them. And they felt drawn in, into this visual, performative, and sonic elements and inter in the interaction with the, of the performer with the orb and the landscape. So they said, um, with Resi, I thought it came across pretty well through the visual and auditory level that these orbs were activated because they were so distorted and then sounded themselves. It was actually immediately clear that she would go there or he would go there and record something, then the orb would replay it. Or they said, I think it was an essential principle that you could follow the eyes of the performer. This is the first pers person perspective. And it helped to put myself in her position. And it definitely worked better this way. Um, the cultural reference to well-known game types like sports game using Y and the use of the interface with the VR headset that underlined the impression for them that it was a game-related work. And um, it also helped them to, let's say, digest the weirdness of the world. They said, for example, um, I think that it won't work without these game elements because it is actually weird to listen to for most people. It is very, very weird music. So we didn't have an audience which was specialized in, specialized in contemporary music, but we had really people who came from all, from, from very different uh, aesthetic backgrounds. But it was also, they also said, um, for me, the gaming character was, was gone immediately because I saw no, no rules, no goals. Um, they couldn't understand why do you do that now? What is the mo motivation behind it? So this really free and open world that Resi offers put some people off. Or they say, um, it was too much for them. And it was, um, yeah, they say it was uh, one described as dystopian or nightmarish or overwhelming, which we can see here. Occasionally, I looked away because there were a lot of impressions at once, and there was almost a bit overwhelming, actually. Um, so I'm um, at the at the end of my talk. Um, again, I would like to start, uh, or I would like to pick up on these two perspectives, the audience perspectives and the uh, performance perspectives. So from the audience perspective, we can see that tacit knowledge is something which can be very important. Tacit knowledge helps audience members to relate to a performer's ludic or performative action and to identify with the person in, in or the situation. And it turns even into further inner involvement because um, as, so tacit knowledge was what is that? Um, sociologist Stephen Turner says um, that tacit knowledge 
allows for better understanding and communication. He says, some activity, inference, or communicative act depends on both the user and the recipient possessing some inferential element or mechanism which allows them to understand, anticipate, cooperate, or coordinate with another. And in Ressi's work, uh, that, that seemed to speak to the audience through their knowledge of the open games. And um, from the performance perspective, the conditions for involvement, um, you could say that dynamic interaction with a computer system does not in itself evoke a performative involvement, but it is always, uh, or it seems that it always is linked to situations of meaningfulness. Meaningfulness is what thrives uh, in um, the, the, the performative agency and uh, involvement. And by in RESI, RESI aimed at building a system in which performer and audience and the virtual realm and the physical concert space are really tightly intertwined. And the actions and gestures in the physical space have clearly discernible artistic results in the virtual space. So um, the concert space is technology, technological and stage setup translates these actions and results to the audience in an understandable way. There, this is why it strengthens involvement and the feeling of meaningfulness for both player and audience members. Okay, this is it. Um, these are my references. They are also the proceedings. And thank you very much. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. I'm still there. <laughs> Are you willing to uh, entertain any questions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I wonder if we have any questions here in the uh, in the virtual world. We still have some people here on Skype. If anybody has any questions, I see we have a hand up. Go ahead. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, it's just a basic question. Actually, what is gamified music? Is it a music that contains game's rules like win and lose, strategies, and then checkpoint and so on with or without visualization in the screen? Or it should be there's a game that projected in the screen and it become, became, uh, becomes part of the, of the piece itself? Oh, that's a very interesting yeah. question. So um, we we don't it, we don't even call it gamified anymore. We call it ludified because we want to say okay, these are audiovisual works which incorporate game elements, game strate uh, strategies, or sometimes even just game aesthetics. Um, it is not that we use a game which we then turn into an audiovisual art, but we say okay. We, uh, we take from computer games, we take essential principles, which we then, um, these principles as, as, as like uh, a strategy or a, like, uh, like they are used in computer games, we use them now in, um, in audiovisual artworks. And then we see what happens um, if we have an artwork which is not an artwork per se, but is influenced by by these kinds of aesthetics and principles and so on, and what happens then to the performer, to the composition, to the audience. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, uh, I, I have a question, if you don't mind. I always have questions. Sure, um, wonderful. It seems like one of the big takeaways from your paper is that the tacit knowledge is exceedingly important and that the more the audience is in on the game and uh, the more they find uh, meaning in the uh, performer's actions. So um, I was a, a little bit confused because when I watched part of the video, okay, I didn't watch the whole video, um, but when I watched the video, it wasn't quite clear to me how and why the landscape went from flat to volcano, uh, and precisely what the interaction with the orbs was. And my feeling was like uh, you mentioned, the participants who said that they felt frustrated because they felt like, first of all, I don't know 
what this person is seeing, and I feel left out of something. Two, I don't really understand the rules of the game, and I feel like instead of attending to the sounds as aesthetic objects of contemplation, I spend all of my time trying to figure out what are the rules of the game, and how are the orbs changing, and how is the performer interacting with the orbs. So uh, I feel like I missed the point of the piece. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, um, first of all, I think it's it's really difficult to um, mm, to show the whole experience of the of the piece in in the in, in the video. Uh, it is a documentation, obviously, but still, um, um, what we learned in this in this uh, project gap is that. Um, Tacit knowledge can be very, very. An audience is not just one audience, first of all. So um, you have now different comments from different um, different audience members. For some of them, um, they understood this principle of the open world and they didn't expect rules, but they saw it more as an exploration of a landscape, and um, and and they were drawn into that. And, uh, but it could also be that there is a different audience member who is very familiar with contemporary music, for example, or with uh, interactive music. And then their tested knowledge would be, okay, I know how it feels like when I'm, when I'm performing it. I have a sensor and, the sen and I, I have a sound and it's put into a computer uh, game system. Uh, or a computer system, and then something is changed. So they can then relate through their test of knowledge. They can relate to what is going on on an interactive contemporary music multimedia level. You see. So, um, but then there is uh, maybe the the um, the audience member who, when he or she hears hears uh, it's about games, then they are looking for the obvious they are looking for oh it must be rules and then where is the rule you know so um the only thing i wanted to say is that tacit knowledge and i don't specify which kind of tacit knowledge because that will be different with every single uh, audience member but tacit knowledge is is a way into a performance and um, it could also be like, uh, okay, they use a VR system, a headset at home, and then they say, okay, I'm, uh, I'm seeing now on the screen what this performer is seeing behind the VR glasses. And although it's not 3D on the screen, um, I can relate to that because I know what it feels like if I'm wearing VR glasses and I'm walking through a landscape and and uh, and then I see this steep ravine and um, this is the way how this is why this performer walks so weirdly on stage because for them it's a 3D landscape and not a 2D you know yeah. you know yeah. what I mean does it answer your question yeah I just um, I don't even know how to ask the other thing I want to ask which is that so on, mm -hmm. in this particular performance you have a performer you have VR yes. glasses, you have the audience, yes. and you have a video screen. So yes. that's a lot. Which um, yes. So what I think of, even I'm trying to think of a, a very primitive type of what you're doing situation would be like a Christian Wolf piece from 1950, where the performers are, there are maybe two performers, no electronics, no screen, no nothing, just two people at the piano, one person has to play something but has to wait for the other person to finish or something like that, right? In that kind of situation, even if you can't discern the rules of the game, you're maybe aware of a heightened concentration and of the performer's interaction and listening to each other. So is that tacit knowledge or is that, I don't even know what you would call that. Like to me it's just like a, heightened concentration on top of already a heightened performance situation when you're aware, even if you don't know what the score says, that this person, what per performer A does is contingent on what performer B does. So I guess what I'm wondering is that in a situation that is more bare like that, where there's less information, 
maybe it's easier to um, get the effect that you're, uh, for, that some of your composers are going for. In other words, is it possible that what you're presenting is far too polyphonic for anybody to get? No, <laughs> that's the simple answer. <laughs> it really, it really depends on the person who watches. Uh, I, I absolutely get what you're saying, but um, we we don't look at it. Um, um, look, we, we we were really experimenting with that. We had in this in this gap project, we also had pieces because actually what you were saying is one of our hypotheses. We thought, okay. If there is gain in, in even completely in, and nobody understands that there are rules behind it, or nobody knows that they, they the audience will we, we thought that the audience will feel this kind of a heightened awareness that uh, of, of the competition, even if they don't understand that there is a competition, or uh, that something is going on between these two, two players, or between one player and, and the computer system. Or, yeah. But um, I think this might be what you just now said, this might be the case for you, but um, excuse me, uh, forgive me if I'm saying that for somebody of a, a younger generation who is in, in a daily way um, uh, involved in these kind of computer games on this many multimedia possibilities and everything is going on at the same time, they might say, I really enjoy what uh, Resi is doing there and I really have an easy access to that and I don't feel that it is overwhelming. So we had both, you know, we had these people who said, oh wow, I'm really drawn by it. And then there were other people who said, oh, me, uh, that it. But I think this is for us in, 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 in respect to audience uh, observation. Um, this was really something we took away from that, that audience is, uh, uh, is not one, one entity, but it's, it is an entity which can react in a, in a concept that you have an, an, an impression that while well, most of them were drawn in or we had this really beautiful atmosphere or something like that, but if you look closely, um, if you really ask different people, then it will be very, very diverse how they experience a concert. For sure. And of course, I didn't experience the concert itself, right? I'm seeing yes. yeah. not even the whole piece and in, in a completely yes. different, so it may very well go, you know, despite my uh, advanced age, <laughs> that I might. I'm the, the same <laughs> age, probably. <laughs> but if I was actually there, maybe I would get uh, a lot more of it, so um, for sure. So I, I, I yeah. leave open that possibility, but I'm very curious. Uh, uh, about it, so I, I wish I, I could uh, experience the piece live in a concert setting, and and uh, maybe it would be very different for me. But it, maybe it's interesting for you to know that Christa Bresi is now starting a doctoral um, doctoral project, uh, actually at uh, my university, and he's really concerned exactly with this question. He really wants to know if I'm uh, offering an open world and a game-like world to uh, to the audience. What should be the strategies so that the audience can feel involved and that they understand what is going on and that they understand uh, the, the spontaneousness of the situation and the agency which is in the room. And so he is very much concerned with this question and he is starting his big doctoral adventure right now on exactly this topic. <laughs> Very good. So, uh, we all confront that, I think, as composers. Uh, even if it's not a game element, if it's anything that we want to get across to the audience, I think we always, my inclination is to say we always underestimate how much we have to give to the audience to get the hooks into them so that we... Yes. Because we see, my problem anyway as a composer is that I'm so close to the work that's, and I, I understand it so deeply since I'm the one making it that I maybe don't understand 
uh, what beginner's eyes would look like just looking at that particular piece. So, um, in any case, it's a fascinating, Absolutely. very hard, mm -hmm. uh, very hard question for a dissertation. So. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> any other questions? I don't want to monopolize. I feel bad. I'm like the moderator, and I'm like gone all the time. Does anyone, any of our virtual participants, want to chime in? No. Anyone here? Okay, I think we're good then. Unless, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I think we're uh, we're good. Thanks so much for your amazing talk. Thank you very much, and I'm so sorry that I missed it all. I would have loved to come to Korea and experience everything with you. Yeah. So, I don't know, this is your last day today? Yes. Uh, okay, so enjoy, yeah. and have nice concerts, and thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>